All right, welcome back everybody. It's my pleasure to announce our next speaker, Anne-Marie Band, who is a veteran trader and also the chief market strategist over at thetradingbook.com. Uh, Anne-Marie, thank you so much for your time and welcome. It's my pleasure to be here. You know, folks, the great thing is that we have somebody like Richard and Trader Lion because 20 years ago when I started trading, there was nothing like this at all. We are living in the golden times of, of uh, getting talent to come together and share. So I thank you for this opportunity, but also for everybody we're really, really fortunate to have things like this. And so I'm going to hop right into things. Um, I uh, Do I need to share this or do we have it up there already? Everything's already up, up and ready to go. It looks Perfect. Like. Okay. So if you don't know me, um, I've been around for almost 20 years, actively trading for about 18. I wrote a book that sold a lot of copies and uh, it's, it's simply called The Trading Book. And you can find me on the Benzinga Pro platform. You can find me on the money.net platform. You can find me on Twitter, StockTwits. And the big thing for me is trying to separate signal from noise because there is a lot of information out there. And that information, we don't really know how to parse it. So I'm going to try and get us to a space where we can go, okay, quickly, I know what to look for in a trade. Important. Hey, listen. This is education here that I'm sharing with you. I'm not a financial advisor. And so I do need to remind you that everything that we talk about is education. They're not recommendations to buy stock and it involves risk of loss and you can lose a lot. I should know I have lost a lot of money before I started making it consistently. And so what I wanna show you is one of the ways that I really find winners just using my eyeballs and it helped me clean up a lot of what it is that i was looking at in the market space because i hear a lot and we read a lot and we have no idea somebody's saying the sky's falling and we're going to fall into a massive depression somebody says we're going to make new highs next month everybody's talking about something that's important to their frame of reference and so the big thing is, hey, can we have a visual approach? So what I want to show you is the first part, what we're going to really look at is number one, and that's the observe of this OODA loop. So the OODA loop is observe, orient, decide, and act. And it's used by all the U.S. fighter pilots when they are in the cockpit and they are continually analyzing what they're seeing off of their horizon or through their visors. And so the number one thing that we sort of miss is this observe spot. And so we're really going to focus on observe today. And that's going to really help you as you move forward, taking a look at, okay, how do I orient? How do I decide? How do I act? Because there are so many fantastic instructors here that are really telling you, listen, here's how you can go about these things. And once you understand your framework, you can work with them individually and develop your skill overall as you move forward through understanding. And so the way we're going to do this is from the bottom up visual. And so we're going to use something called a heat map. And most of us know what heat map is. It's something you see at the end of the day and it's either very red, very green, or some sort of pale version. And a lot of times we look at it, we can go, oh yeah, that was a risk off day. Or, oh yeah, that was a risk on day. And we, we don't take anything away from that. Well, what I wanna show you is how much you can take away from a visual strength heat map look. And I call it the bottom up visual event. And so what it does is send us through a, a number of spaces. So this was Friday. I just took this. Everything is very recent. And this gives us a day of performance. Now, a lot of times we look at these things and we go, yeah, yeah, all right. 
I can see that nobody was really up and nobody was really down. The most up was Tesla. And I'm not really sure if that's because folks knew that Elon was going to say, hey, listen, I'm withdrawing my bid for Twitter, which he did in the afternoon. Or it could be whatever, right? But it's just one day that's a snapshot. So I need to see more than that. So I'm going to look at a week. And now notice this. We've got a lot of red over here, some very bright red down here in these edges, and everything's sort of pale in this space. But if we move to a week, we can see where big money has been moving, and it's been moving consistently day over day over day. And so when you compare a week to a day, you can go, oh, yeah, that day was kind of muted, but I know overall – Everybody was buying consumer signals, consumer uh, con communication services, technology, and they were still selling energy, right? Overall, the whole week, down in basic materials, we start seeing a little bit of motion. But overall, from a week, we can see that money has flowed in to these spaces. And so... You have to put that in your head and go, all right, I see where they're moving now, but what's it look like before that? And so now I'm going to look at a month. And what you'll notice is that a month ago, if we took the numbers to where we are today, in just a month, this is very red. Semiconductors, very red consumer defensive, very green overall in the big pieces, particularly discount stores, and then healthcare and manufacturing. So when you look at things like that and you go, what is that telling me? If you compare the month, which, excuse me, the week, which looks very green in these spaces, and you look past, you know that in the last week, people have stopped selling consumer cyclical communication defenses, healthcare, technology, and financial. And just by looking at that, you can actually tell that the stock market has been running up. Just as simple as that. If you want to go how much it's been running up or what it's been actually doing, we go back. And we look at something, say, three months ago, and we'll see here, if we look at a three-month period, we can see that Baba, JD, and Pinduoduo were moving up. Well, what do we know about those guys? They're all Chinese. And so you can say, wait a second, people are buying up the Chinese stocks. And so you can look overall at these faces and say, I can tell from a flow perspective what's going on with big money. So let's think about the takeaways that I've talked about here. And so the takeaways are this. Big money movement can be seen, and it can be seen more effectively over a week, a month, three months, six months. It can also be tracked. So you can look at something and go, okay, I'm going to circle this, and I'm going to see if they buy it again next week or if the whole group is getting bought. Once I can track that, I can say, all right, if I want the wind at my back and I want to go long, I'm going to go where I see the whole region is getting bought up, and then I'm going to look for strength. Or I'm going to go to the whole region where everything's getting sold, and I'm going to look for weakness. And so when you look at that, all of a sudden, any notes that you see, any streams that go, hey, this looks like a great stock, or this looks like a great stock, you can go right to that bottom-up visual and go, you know what? That's, a, that's an outlier. It's the only one running up. I don't have the wind up my back. And that wind at your back is what I call that money ball approach. And that is your on-base percentage for getting involved in that sector. If you 
Find yourself in places where the wind is at your back. Trend is going to be good to you. And if trend is going to be good to you, then half of the things that you need to think about from a risk perspective are totally gone. So let's take a look at this. This is all of them together. This is a six month one. This is one day, seven days, 30 days and 180 days. And again, here's what you see, 180 days, six months. So if you look from January to July, where we are right now, you'll still notice that energy is still an outperformer. And you'll still notice that technology is still an underperformer. And you'll still notice that even from last week, which we just finished, to six months ago, people are going into healthcare. So we've seen a lot of rotation back into cyclical. You can see it's really red here, and now it's green. So these things are lifting off of their bases. You can see that they're moving back into tech, but tech is still light on that space. And you can see that no matter what, everybody has still moved in to the healthcare space. What they're doing more of is biotech and that sort of thing. So now that we know this, take away the following for yourself. Again, for me, everything is about being simple. And simple can translate into a very deep level of knowledge about the market if you're just looking at the visuals and you're saying, wait, what does it mean if I go from green in my current week, whereas in the past, I've still looked at that red space. Now, what really it should tell you are things like, hey, I bet you if I look in healthcare, some of these guys are going to be making 52 week highs. Why? Because no, nope, they haven't really dipped. It's been green through every single one of these. So you might think to yourself, well, do I really want to go someplace I've got 52 week highs? Maybe not. Maybe you want to buy a dip in energy if you don't believe that we are entering a very deep recession or you think it's going to be a fade and then a bounce or you feel really solid about tech and you want to move forward. So let's go to an actual chart. Um, let's do this and let's go to a new share. Uh, screen one. There we go. Oops. Let's move you and me out of here. All right. Um, and so now this is the Finviz website. And what we are looking at here. Hi, Marie. Is I'm a... still seeing the uh, other visuals. So you might have to stop sharing. Oops, sorry. Sure. There no we worries. go. How about that? Yep. There we go. Okay. Fantastic. All right. So this, we're looking at a week. And I have it on a full screen event so you can see it. But I am looking at the world. If you want to look at the S&P 500, it looks a little bit different. But you can still see. You, well, you can see a lot more charts from this perspective, but here's what this gives you. When you hover in a place like this, it'll give you the list of guys that are sitting in the box, right? So in the last week, we can see that um, everything's green from, say, NVIDIA and uh, Texas Instruments and so on and so forth. So that might be a space where we go, hey, it was looking pretty bad. Now it's looking OK. And I can see that my chart is sort of flattening out. Maybe that's where I go if I'm looking for a long. So the first thing you want to think about when you're trading is the following. Do you want to go long or do you want to go short? And knowing which way you're slanted, is the market going to be a headwind or a tailwind? And that's really what your charts are going to start telling you. So what I really wanted to do is jump specifically into, I'm going to leave it on full because we can see a lot more um, 
choices, and we're going to look at some things like healthcare and biotech. Why? Um, one, I think it's probably a safe bet for upward rotation because the chart is actually looking fairly good from a SPY perspective. So let's go here and let's first see, let's take a look at SPY. And so let's go through our checklist. Remember, you just go to your, your spaces and you say one day, seven day, 30 days, and you see what the rotation looks like. Then you go, all right, do I want to be long? Do I want to be short? If you want to be short, go to one of those boxes that's mostly red and then start digging into those spaces. And you can use a lot of different techniques here. Um, I'm going to use, Brian and I happen to use the same five simple moving average that is guilty until proven innocent, as it were. And we're going to look at the weekly chart in SPY. And we're going to see that we're just coming up over that crest of motion, but we could be a little bit landlocked. So why am I going to SPY? Well, I'm going to SPY to see if I have a headwind or a tailwind, depending on whether I'm long or short. And so that's really what I want to do here. And what I see from a weekly perspective is I'm a little bit sideways. So the strength of a stock is going to matter more if my chart is sideways. So if you're looking for something to go long, looking for something to go short, make sure you've got a steeper trend that's in your favor because the broad market is going to be a little bit sideways. However, if I go to a daily chart, does it work better if I'm in a light scale or a dark scale? What do we think about this? Yay, nay. I think either works. Uh, I think whatever you prefer is good. All right. So if we look at the daily chart, what we can see, and this is super important, folks, how do you know when you're picking a bottoming area that potentially will hold, you stop making new lows. And so this is what the SPY is doing. Since June 17th, we've stopped making lows. And so looking at that, you can take away from this space to say, hey, listen, I know that I'm not heading lower here, but I'm also not heading higher. So again, when we see the SPY not in a real upward rotation or not in a real downward rotation, we can say, all right, I need to look for strength in a formation. So let's take a look at a few of these that I've isolated from this chart formation. The first one I've isolated is C4 Therapeutics, and that's biotech. Right. And here is something wonderful about this particular chart. Now, uh, Joe Fami is going to be on after me, which he's amazing. Uh, just a tremendous wealth of knowledge. He and I have been both looking at this biotech and uh, healthcare space for motion. And C4 also got noted on the IBD list. And so... This could be very nice. So what is it? It's above the five simple moving average. That's my ribbon right here. I have a five nine. And so the ribbon tells me what's going on before it turns green. And so I see that I'm at the top of resistance, but I also um, have a floor that's at about 752. Now, because Here's my philosophy. My philosophy is if I have a downward sloping moving average and price rockets through it, who I really am bumping into are all the sellers that got all the buyers, excuse me, that got trapped right around this $10 region where they said, nope, this is a buy zone. This is going to be awesome. Ten's a nice round number. And they bought it and it continued to fade. Now, the wonderful thing about this is that it's been holding these ledges since about March. And so this is a nice early stage break 
that could really take us from nine first all the way up to 21. How long that would take, I don't know, might be a while, but it's a lovely space that all the things are conspiring towards a very nice trade event. How would I trade this? I never like to buy the tops. I always want to look for where was the last time resistance was tested at support. And that is somewhere near 785 to 8. And so I'm going to create an alert on this line. And I'm going to give it a loose bit of, of uh, um, I'm going to give it a loose bit, call it a support zone. And then I'm going to create. And that's going to send me an alert and let me know. No matter what platform you use, create alerts and realize that just because you want to jump in and trade today doesn't mean that the chart is ready for you to make um, the choice of putting your money at risk. The reason that I'm here after 20 years is that after the first year and a half, two years, I learned about risk. The first few years, I was absolutely an abomination to any kind of trader ever. I made terrible mistakes, and I was also extremely impatient. And really, if we want to trade in the market space, impatience is one of the things we deal with all the time. Listen, I still deal with it today when I'm looking for a price and I'm saying, I know it's going to come in there today. <sighs> all right, I'm going to have to put an alert and wait. And so that allows me to keep more of my money out of harm's way. And if there's one thing that I could share with you about actual trading mechanics, it's that. And it's specifically when you put a stop, you have to look for a stop that says, if it comes into this area, then what I thought about this means that I'm potentially very wrong. So if this comes in to my eight and it does not bounce above it, so I'm going to watch it, it's going to bounce. And I'm going to wait until the next candle closes. And I'm going to say, all right, what's it doing? Your thought might be, but Anne-Marie, it could move 3 4 5%. Uh, yes, but we are looking for something that's about 100% return here over time based on this chart and its relative strength and how long it's been basing. And so give it a little room. If you don't catch it at the very bottom, it's okay, right? Let the chart stay guilty until proven innocent, as we steal from Brian. So that space would be, hey, listen, I know I'm crashing into sellers. And those sellers came in right at around that 10 zone. And so I'm going to have to watch it there. I expect it to fade. I want it to come in. And then you can begin with a position to the north. I really like this one because it's sitting on a base. Now, let's take a look at a short, okay? One of the biggest things that a lot of macro guys are talking about is what copper is doing right now. And so copper is in a free fall, and it's in a free fall because we anticipate that the rising dollar is going to put a tremendous squeeze on emerging markets and other markets, as well as um, dampening all the things that have to do with demand. So demand destruction is showing up inside of the copper charts. And Freeport MacRan, or however MacRan says their name, Freeport, they have been in a very downward trend and they had a doji event just at the end of this week. So what does that doji event sort of tell us? Remember, a doji is something that sort of spins in an axis that has a high and a low. 
but everybody converges on the same price overall. And so what a doji really means to me is indecision. And so if I were looking for a short, which I, I am looking for a short here in this copper space, I'm really much more keen on waiting for it to bounce into an old resistance area before I engage in um, the short trade. See, if I get it here and I'm at a swivel point where I'm going to run back up into my moving average, notice my ribbon here, right? It's downward sloping. I turn around, I run for three weeks up into this ribbon, and then it rotates right over. I would not be surprised to see the chart do the very same thing. So what are we looking for on Monday? Now, on Monday, if all goes as it should, I actually expect a bounce event in the chart. So what would my support ledge be? Well, for me, I'm going to look just below that line. That number is $27.71. If it happens to gap up, which it could, I don't think it will, but if it does, you want to look for that gap to actually hold this line in the sand. And that's 29.20. If it holds 29.20, 27.70 will be your stop, and you can actually trade it long up through the edges of these weekly candlesticks with your first target being 30.97 and your second target being 32.34, right? So how do we remember that we've got an alert set here? I would move this fringe up just a wee bit into the close. And when I create alert, I'm going to give it a wider sensitivity event, right? And so I'm going to say, hey, if it comes down anywhere near here, let me know. I'm going to put it up on my screen and then I'm going to be able to buy it. Notice it does not change the stop of 2770. If it loses the open of the prior week, we've got trouble. It could go all the way back down to 26. Now, if you're saying, Anne-Marie, come on, it's a dollar. What is that? 4%. I can live with that. If you can live with that, that's okay. For you, you have to think about how long am I going to carry this? Probably only one to two weeks because it's going to rotate down. And it could stop at any one of these things 31, 32, and then rotate down because you're trading counter trend. If you take a long at a base like this, you will have the market as a headwind, and that headwind could cause a little bit of difficulty for a nice run to the upside. All right? So that's for downward motion. Now, let's say that you actually believe that oil has been running too hot and it's due for a pullback, all right? And it's going to be a pullback over time. Now, again, this is sitting underneath my five, simple moving average on the weekly. This is how I do it for everything. I started trading the market short on all my cycles for trending formation if I close the week under my five weekly. That's it for me. Under, if it's above it, great and trending, even better. I can buy the pullbacks. When I'm underneath that five on a weekly, I'm looking for shorts. I am not looking for long opportunities within that chart because I know that within that chart, that is a headwind. Now, on the flip side, since the market has been running up for the last week, notice what happened to the Exxon chart. It came down into a deeper support area, lower than that 81, so it came into 8090, and then it recovered. Oh, I want to share this with you. Listen, 
just because price breaks a level to the north or south doesn't mean that that support level has been invalidated. Someone with no knowledge of market mechanics can come in and force price lower. There's a really great story about, I don't know who it is, some super famous trader that had a newbie that came to work for him because they were technical analysts. And they said, no, that's not going any lower. And the guy picked up the phone and said, sell 10,000 at two pennies below this number. And it went lower. So the thought process is that, sorry, folks, the thought process is, hey, listen, I've got uh, price action. It could go lower, but it could also recover off of those lows. So please redo that in your mind. If you go, oh, no, it's broken resistance. That means it's going higher. Not even. Not even. Take a look at how many times. If you had said to yourself, hey, as soon as it breaks 92, I'm going back long. That's obviously resistance. Everybody here upside down in the trade. Everybody here upside down in the trade. Let the chart tell you what it does after it tests that level. Then you'll know what's going on. So what do we anticipate? This is two weeks of doji style action. These guys are flush with cash. But they are pulling back because of a demand destruction story that really is coming into the price of oil. If you trade the futures and you look at the oil markets right now, they are in something called backwardation. If I go into January's contracts, they're charging me $82. Of course, I have to pay the premium for the 104 that it closed at on Friday. But that forward contract is telling me the price is coming in. And so it's going to bring the oil complex with it. What do you do? You wait for the bounce, like another big wick. It's already under the five. The five is downward sloping. And so you're going to look for something right around the area of 90 or so to get yourself something that looks like a short. Right. So, uh, again, relative sensitivity, if it goes off, don't immediately go, I'm going to short, but you want to end up looking at, hey, what's my four hour chart say? What's the daily chart say? Or simply let it close the day when the alert goes off. And if it opens up lower the next day, you've got your short and you can pull right back down into this 82 area. It's going to be a very pretty trade and there are going to be a lot of people caught on the wrong side of this because we all know that in the end oil's going to go back up it's just not going back up now it's going back up later and so let's just follow the candlestick prices to tell us what's going on all right here is another one that is a kind of an easy long occidental petroleum now, why am I saying, hey, listen, this might be an easy long, even though it's in the oil complex? Well, Warren Buffett is buying this hand over fist, absolutely hand over fist. So we know that it's in a depressed area that is um, oil and the like right now in the short term. So do we rush right in and buy it? No. What we want to do is wait for this chart to come in on the floor because what it's going to do is outperform. Notice, you see what Exxon's chart looks like? See this one, two, three, four downward weeks and Occidental's chart? It's got four weeks down just like uh, Exxon had, but the last two weeks have been have been up solidly. Are we above the five? No. So what that means is it's got to make a floor and let the chart settle out. So where I would like, this would be my floor, 5440. That would be my support ledge. If it loses that ledge, I'll have to look at all my longs and say, I probably should get out of here. Of course, 
I've been buying Occidental since it's had all kinds of troubles. So I've been in this one for a long time. And these are really great prices, but they could come in a little bit. And so if it hits this floor, I would put an alert on. But if it holds this region, confirmation candle, we'll leave it on the daily. If it holds this region and comes into this when everything else is failing and doesn't go through, going to be ideal for it to move $10. I mean, legitimately, there's going to be some very nice price action sitting in Occidental. Right? Is it going to move $10 in one day? No. But it could move that way in two months. And so very important chart to have a look at because it's got more strength than everyone else. And energy in itself will continue to rise over time. So this is something that I have, of course, as an investment. It could be something that you could consider from that space, hey, listen, I'm just going to buy the dips when it gets really high. I'll take some of it off. And so you're always trading around a position. All right, here's the last one. And it's a short, and it probably is going to give a couple of people some heartache. And it's Sherwin-Williams. So let me give you, one, the reason for why. One, the ISM numbers. Um, and so let me show you what an ISM is. Oopsie, search, economy, that's the PMI, sorry, 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 sewer price, CPI, oh, we're getting some of those next week, where in the world is my, oh. there we go, all right, <clears throat> so what, what does this mean, right? Notice this thing has been falling since March, okay? Now it's at 57. Everybody's saying, hey, listen, if it gets to 50, it's going to be really, really bad. This was 2020 savage deep motion. This 2018 area is where we had a little bit of debt trouble also. That's how we can always tell when we've got trouble. We'll, we'll see things happening in the debt markets and because... Powell continues to raise rates. He, saw, he said, hey, listen, we're going to go another 75 basis points. It's going to continue to bring manufacturing in. And so this downward slope says we're going to have a little demand destruction. You can see that by the copper chart that I showed you. But how is the ISM built? It's built on the housing and um, the uh, energy spaces and all the things that come into housing from manufacturing of goods. And so if interest rates go up, the first thing that get hits that gets hit are mortgages. When those mortgages get hit, less people buy homes. And when you buy less homes, you buy less stuff for homes. And that sort of rolls everything into all the things used for homes. One of the most solidly performing charts over a very long haul has been Sherwin Williams. But what we're seeing what we're looking at now is a cyclical decline that I think also is going to be a downward spiral for Sherwin Williams. And so right now we can see just like the broad market, it's been lifting, but it's sitting underneath that five. So where where might it go? And so, oh, I thought that was my line. It is my line. So what we want to do is actually wait for this chart to try to bounce with the rest of the broad market in broad enthusiasm because it's got quite a bit of institutional ownership. And so you might say, Anne-Marie, this is the worst idea you ever had of a short. It's got tons of institutional ownership. Why would you want to do that? Well, I don't necessarily want to short right now, but what I do want to watch is the collapse of price and the collapse of interest once the price action gets back up into this 275 area. So you might say, you know, 
how about I just trade it long into there? You can, but it's under this five, and any time it bounces off of that five area, it's going to find resistance and come back down. So these are a few things. They're all actionable for Monday morning when you get in there. One of the big things that you want to take away out uh, as part of study is step away from from trading what you think and let the market tell you through price what everybody is doing. And can I tell you, that's one of the hardest things to do ever. It's incredibly difficult to do, but I promise you, if you do that and you follow the price signals and you read and you understand what's happening inside of price action in the grand scheme, you're going to end up being totally in love with trading like I am, but also very in tune with what's in your portfolio. All right, that's all I have. I um, don't know if you'd like to ask some questions or if yeah, anything. Yeah, we've got plenty. Yeah. And, and while I'm asking these first few questions, if anybody in the audience has any, leave them down below in the chat. Uh, first of all, I want to ask you, once you've identified some of these spots on the weekly, uh, could you give an example about how you might actually execute the trade, looking at the daily chart, looking at the four-hour chart that you mentioned, um, you know, managing risk and all that and, and doing this specific entry? Wow. Okay, great. Let's do the one I believe that is most actionable. And we'll talk about what we're going to do on Monday. So nice, solid movement up for three weeks. I still believe I have downside pressure here. So I'm going to go to the four hour chart. And I love, um, I love the VWAP. I don't anchor it because there's a skill to anchoring and <laughs> I don't have that skill. So I just use the regular VWAP and I use some uh, ribbons. And so what I notice uh, for my ribbons is that I'm sitting on the top edge of these uh, secondary ribbons, but my VWAP is flat. And so I know this is my support zone. I'm going to have an alert set here for when it breaks through on the four hour formation. And what I'm going to be doing is waiting for this chart to rotate in. So I'm going to have it on my watch list for Monday. Two things can happen. I can break out above 10. I'm going to go back to the daily. I can break out above 10 or I can gap down right into this noisy patch here where everything's just run. And so I could have here, okay? Now, I looked at the option chains for this and they're very thin or I would do something about that. So, two choices we have when getting into a trade like this. I know my floor is down here. This is gonna be, oh my goodness, the apple of my eye trade. If it comes down and hits the level, I'm gonna wait for it and go, boom, I'm, I'm in. If, however, I come in and I don't dip, meaning let's say I break out through 10, I'm never going to chase a breakout when my formation looks like this. Truth be told, it can leave you behind sometimes, but mostly not. Take a look at the last time. Watch this. How to know charts do the same thing over and over again. I might say to myself back in the past, hey, I believe in this. Look at how many weeks this thing has moved sideways like this. And these guys report in just a couple of days. So how, how nice that looks. As soon as it pops up over here, I'm buying the breakout. That would have been the absolute worst thing for me. So what you want to do is pay attention to how the participants behave in a stock. And what I notice from here is that if I break out, I'm going to come back in. And so I'm definitely not, if it pops up and it pops up to 14, I am not getting in this stock until it fades, unless I'm buying 10 shares. And then, 
you know, whatever. But I'm not going to expose myself to any kind of risk. So Perfect. that's how I that's what I would do. And I would set it up right there. I would say, hey, I'm going to put an alert here at my 889. If it comes in, chops around, I'm going to go long stock. I don't like the option chains. They're too expensive and they're too thin. And I'm going to leave a little bit back that says, all right, let's say it does dip and you actually get your sweet spot. Do you want to have dry powder to pick up there? So if it comes in here, I'll go half size. And I'll go in full size if it comes in here and bounces. And my stop is going to be right underneath that edge where all of my premises about the price action holding will evaporate if it loses that zone. Perfect. And uh, kind of flipping the script a, a little bit, I'd love to ask you about your kind of weekend and daily routines that you know, inform you about, you know, the, the health and strength, uh, strength of the overall market, as well as how you actually go about finding these type of ideas. Okay, great. Again, it's just like I showed you in the very beginning. That's the first thing that I'll do. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm a little bit wonky for a technical trader because I love the macro story. And I think people trade macro and forget that it moves at a glacial pace. And so I'm always looking at the macro. And then I'm saying, okay, these macro guys are saying this, but price is actually doing that. And so at the end of the day, I will listen to what somebody's saying, but then I'll go back to the charts and I'll say, do I have evidence of that? Right. If the answer is yes, I'll do a deeper dive. And then I'll start looking at, okay, who's got the most strength, whether I'm looking for an investment or a trade. If I'm looking for an investment, I'm always going to look for heavy institutional ownership because I know they're not going to pitch things out. So I'm always going to be looking for heavy institutional ownership. And then on top of that, I'm going to be looking for price reliability. How does it gap? Um, because what I don't want to do is wake up on a Monday after having a restful weekend and be in panic zone because something I'm really keen on is dropping, you know, 10%. And I'm looking at something very nasty on the day. So I'm not the one that would chase memes. I'm not the one that would chase high flyers. Um, those sorts of things maybe break out in hives. And so I'm just a little bit more uh, timid on that sort of thing. However, if you're into that, then you look at the RTY, no, the RTY, the Russell, RTY mm -hmm. is the futures complex. You look at the Russell in the same way. You do a deep dive. You look at them, you see who's the most red, see who's the most green, and then you just pick one and you can ride the wave because all of these mechanics are set up to help us identify the speed and quality of order flow, right? And that's really all we care about because we're momentum traders. We want to buy low and sell high or sell high to open and buy low to close. And and that's the way that does that. So that's really what I do. I look at pictures um, because I want it simple. I'll read the dense stuff, but I always have to come back to, does it make sense to me to do this? And if it makes sense to me to do it, what is the time frame I'm looking at? Am I looking mm -hmm. at to hold it for three days, three weeks, or three months? Perfect. And uh, being a, a trading coach, I'd love to ask you, what are the common mistakes that you see kind of beginner traders out there make over and over again? And, and what would you kind of recommend for anybody just kind of starting out over the past few months or even their year, two years into this? Um, the big thing that I notice is that there are a lot of us that want, that think we want to learn. But what we really want to do is have someone validate what we already think. Mm -hmm. um, and that, uh, that makes for very, very difficult uh, coaching events. The second thing that folks do is that they build narratives about fear and don't really build systems that are robust enough that can 
survive an expected outcome event. For instance, they come to the trading space and I go, hey, you want to do this, 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 and this? And they'll go, okay, I want to do step one and step four, but I don't want to wait on X, Y, Z. And so folks really have problems putting themselves into consistent routines um, because there's nobody over their head going, hey, I'm going to make you justify the reason that you, like on a prop floor or on a trading desk, you've got a manager coming behind you going every week. He's like, what'd you make that trade for? Why'd you do that? And so you have to learn to defend that state and then realize that if you keep doing it wrong, you're going to lose your job. And that doesn't happen in the trading space. So that personal accountability is a big thing. And then the very last thing that I see traders do is that they start with a system that's not particularly robust. And when it doesn't work, they jump ship to other systems. I can assure you that the majority of folks that are listening, that aren't brand new, already have all the skills you need to excel, but you're fighting your own mental battles by second guessing and then moving from system to system. Because the simplest thing as, hey, I'm gonna use a, a five, nine, moving average cross just so long as you know, I'm above my weekly floor on X, Y, Z. And you can make money time after time after time, but people want to be too active and uh, want to move too quickly instead of just setting with something and going, how can I fix all the things in between sitting in the five? They blame the system and then they go around looking for other systems because nobody wants to look in the mirror and go, yeah, you really ought to work on that personally. That's hard. Yeah, perfect. And a quick follow-up to that, what kind of resources such as books, videos, what have you, uh, would you recommend people um, you know, use when they're first starting out? What, what was most impactful for you personally? I'm going to tell you what's the most impactful thing of late, and that's Jared Tindler, yeah. who sits on um, Trader Lion, and has a coaching uh, a program there. I read his book over the July 4th weekend, and I'm literally, people are like, yeah, you're gonna make them. I'm like, no, I can't, I'm busy. And you know, his approach is so unique mm-hmm. and straightforward that I found it one of the best things ever. Because you know, when I, looked at me, I was very good technically. I just had a lot of things going on in my brain, right? So Denise's market mind games was a game changer for me. Mm -hmm. She Mm -hmm. really has someone, she's someone that I've consistently gone to over time and said, hey, what about this? What about this? What about this? Because she came from a floor, right? She knows that space and she also is very wise about why we make the decisions we do. And I, I really had a lot of technical skill. I was just a train wreck in here. And I had to fix that sort of stuff. And and uh, it took a long road, but it's it's been a beautiful thing. It's been the best thing that's ever happened to me as a human being is learning what things short circuit me that stop me from being uh, a good trader, a good wife, a good friend, a good mother, all of those things end up being the exact same thing in the trading yeah. space, which is fascinating. It's alchemy. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, I dropped the link to the, the masterclass if anybody's interested who's watching. Um, yeah, Jared Tandler, I, I've learned an immense amount from him. I think he'll be speaking day three, uh, which I'm really looking forward to. And um, Emery, I wouldn't, if you don't mind, I'd love to hear a little bit more about those struggles that you were dealing with and how you overcame them as well. Cause I think that I'm sure that would be helpful for everybody watching. Everybody goes through the same type of stuff. So yeah. Okay. So um, one of the biggest things was I couldn't stop the internal dialogue of saying, you're an idiot. Why didn't you see that? 
And so from a training perspective, it's so different to, to being in life, right? So in life, we go, hey, listen, you make a decision, you stick to it, right? And actually, that's what's helped me in the trading space because I've stuck with it for 20 years because I wasn't going to give up. But when I'm in the trade and something goes wrong, I always would think, well, I just got to stick it out. And then it would turn into this gigantic losing space. And I would go, I can't take a loss now. I mean, that's going to wipe out 30% of my balance. I can't do it. And so when I do it, it's like a gate it's a hatchet to the chest it's gaping flesh wound and so not only do i have physical capital destruction i had emotional capital destruction so the first thing i had to do was pump the brakes and go wait do i have a system that works over an expected outcome yes sometimes you lose it happens but if you do it over and over again, the probability and expectations run X, Y, Z. And so I had built some beautiful systems. They were running 75, 85%. The problem is I was leaving myself zero room for being wrong. Mm -hmm. And that is a gigantic fallacy. We have this idea that no matter how, if we work hard and hard and hard and really, really study then our trade's going to go right when we take it. It's not. It's still not because we have error, we have noise, we have our inability to capture everything in the landscape and take everything like it's supposed to be. We could just be flat out wrong or the market could do something wacky. We can lose. And so the question I said to myself was, all right, do you – accept that perfection is impossible. Yes, I understood it in words. I still had trouble understanding it in real live mechanics. And then I started with a pocket of cash on the side. And I would say, okay, you're going to trade like you're supposed to trade. But if you run into this much cash that you've lost, you're going to stop and you're going to go back through each of those trades and you're going to go, did you follow your rule? Did you follow your rules every single time? Because you can't judge yourself on whether the trade is good or bad based on whether it wins or loses. It's a good trade if you followed rules that were good. And once I got to that space, I said, all right. Now, how do I do it so I don't get ahead of myself? And I started trading really small. Mm -hmm. And I said, all right, I want to go from X to Y. Sometimes it would only be $100, but the mechanic was what I was replicating. Mm -hmm. And here's the funny thing the market does to you. So you get the mechanic right, doing it over and over again. It's great. You see something and your brain goes, you know what? I have just hit it out of the park the last six times. I'm going to size up and I am going to give myself a big pat on the back because I want to make X today. Right. And I would outsize myself over leverage. And when it started going against me, that prefrontal cortex shuts down and it's fight, flight, or freeze. And that's all you've got. And so that, for me, I mean, I would get really good, consistent. I take a big trade. I'll lose everything I've lost, made in the last three, four, five weeks, and I'd have to start over. Until I realized that I had to stop looking for that badge of honor so that I could go, hey, look at what I just did, which really is what it was all about. Yeah. It was about so I could feel it and I could tell my husband and I could tell X, Y, Z. And as soon as I realized, hey, listen, you're working with a battle of ego and it's winning and you're putting yourself further and further behind. You just got to stop it. 
And so really, those were the stair steps. And even today now, Richard, I still struggle with it. I will still go, you know what? I'm going to size up. Now what I'm smart about is realizing if it doesn't have the heat, I can get out quickly and then reset. Whereas before, I would just wait and go, oh, no, well, it's got to, and I'll cut it off at at the knees. So that really, you know, it sounds like a simple process, but it was very hard mentally because I had to turn it into new habits. The habit of getting my ego out of the way. The habit of understanding I'm never always going to be right. The habit of the market is always going to be right, and you can be early slash wrong, or can you can be late slash wrong. Right. So just roll with that and be comfortable with getting those small gains of consistency. It's like a guy that might, does a tightrope walk, right? He doesn't start it between two buildings. He starts it two feet from the ground. And so that's where we have to build continuity and that structural space that allows you to embrace all of your emotions and go, okay, I feel concern because I feel fear because, and you're not short circuiting your brain because of the size of your position. Yeah. I think that's something that a lot of people can relate to watching. And, and uh, I think it's something every trader kind of experiences to, a, to an extent. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing that, Anne Marie. And um, there was a question earlier about uh, whether you could kind of define your style and also your time frame, because I think that kind of puts everything in perspective and is, is helpful for everybody watching this. Great. Okay, so my time frames um, run the gamut because I am a futures day trader, and I'm also an options day trader, and I have an investment leg. Now, from an investment perspective, I have really pulled a lot into a cash space. So I'm about 70% cash right now. Will I be missing out on some very nice moves? Sure, but I'm gonna go in and come out because I do have a feeling we're gonna have some sort of seismic event. I don't know what it is. And so from an investment perspective, I'm really pulled back. I have a lot of cash, liquid events, and I intend, you know, when the Fed raises rates, I intend to buy some more CDs because I want my cash to do something, even though it's negative return overall, you know, that's where I'm putting it because I have the sense that I feel I need to be safer. I just... There's too much macro stuff going on that I want to care about. So everything that I make, and I make, I trade to eat, everything I make is on these very short cycles right now. And so if I'm looking at, so for instance, one of my favorites is RRC, that's range resources. It's starting to move very sideways, which I don't like, but they're very, very well run. For me, I'll be waiting for this chart to come back into a support zone, and then I'm either going to sell some puts because I don't mind owning the stock, Mm -hmm. or I'm just going to buy the stock outright, and I'm going to trade it using my four-hour cycles to get itself to the top of the band again. And so my investments, I'm still waiting to deploy big chunks of money when I think there's going to be a much deeper fade. But right now I think we're in a counter trend, short term swing to the North for a lot of different places. And so I want to capitalize on that using my day and four hours. As far as the levels go, I will not take a trade at a level that I can't see on a weekly chart. Mm -hmm. That's my big line in the sand no ifs, ands, or buts. If I don't see people holding a line definitively on a weekly space, I, I'm not going to touch it. And I'm going to get involved when they pull back into that area and they've bounced every time, or they've pulled back into that, they've pu- pushed up into that area and they fade. So that's what I will do. Yeah. So it sounds like those higher time frame levels, those are yes. the most important thing for you. Yeah. Absolutely. Even for intraday trading. 
Right. Even for intraday trading, I'm looking at those weekly levels. Perfect. Because that's where big money will participate, and I always want the wind at my back. Yeah, perfect. And a follow-up to that, um, I was wondering if you could kind of talk about, you know, how much of your process is fundamental-based versus technicals? Because even though we're talking a lot of price action today, it seems like you weigh pretty heavily on what, you know, the Fed is doing, other macro events. So I'd love to hear you talk about that as well. So my thoughts are always economists and folks like, the Federal Reserve and guys that do all that kind of stuff, they make their money by telling us what they believe economic theory should look like in the future. <laughs> so what I will do is I, again, will listen because I, I want to know how they're coming to their ideas. But after I come to their ideas, I go to the charts and go, what's actually happening. So for instance, one macro guy that's in the news, he's done a great job. Listen, I've bought a number of his books, but he's done a great job at talking about the landscape because he wrote a book several years ago that said, hey, listen, Russia is going to invade Ukraine, only a matter of time. So, um, oh, his name fell right out of my head. Z Zion, Peter Zion. So, his newest book was coming out at the same time. And so he's talking about global famine and what's really going to happen in terms of the big picture. But his time horizon is 10, 15, 20 years. People just aren't seeing that. And so he's hitting these headlines talking about, listen, there's going to be trouble with food. Well, right now, you know, the Danes, you see what's happening in the EU. All those mm -hmm. Danish farmers have stood up and said, yeah, no, you're not even letting us allow. Wait, you care about a million people dying, no fertilizer. But if we don't produce food, a hundred million people could die. What? So they're moving up and doing all that stuff. And so for Peter Zion, that sort of dovetails into his storyboard of there's going to be a problem. Except if you look at the commodity space, soft commodities in the last month have just had a nosedive. They're falling to the floorboards. And it could easily be because they were bought up too far too fast. But I'm not going to run in and buy the commodity space when all the big money is selling it off. Mm -hmm. I'm going to wait for the chart to stop heading lower on a weekly basis and then watch for traction to build. So I always want to hear what they're saying because everything takes so long from a macro space. I mean, listen, the housing crisis that we had in 2006, 2007, 2008 was started in 1986 with Ben Bernanke. And so that's a long time. And so I'm listening and I'm taking it with a grain of salt. I'm learning about macro events and then I'm saying all right I hear you I understand you're promoting a book but what is the market telling me and that's what I always go back to where is price where is price and many times as traders we get so caught up in a political narrative or uh, an environmental narrative or something that gets us right in our solar plexus and we go no this is it when you trade like that you're ignoring the most important triggers that you will need and the most important trigger you'll need is price and that's very hard for people to go well you know like some guy came in and went hey i don't even know what oil's behaving in a very unusual way terrible way and if you were watching the oil complex and you read about the ism and you saw what was happening across the pond you could say no wait a second china's totally shut down half of europe is still essentially shut down that's a demand destruction event and if you go look at the wti futures contracts they're in the 80s so mm -hmm. you can't go, 
what's happening to oil? That's because you're not paying attention to the backdrop. But interestingly enough, if you just stare at the price and it breaks that five simple moving average on the weekly, you got to go, I got pump brakes here if I'm thinking about going long. It's just the, it's the simple things that we stick to that are going to keep us in the best of spaces and the wind will always be at our back. But it's hard to parse all of that out and then to take it in and then have to put it to the side. That takes practice, right? Because it's very hard to hold two conflicting ideas in your mind at the same time. You just have to say, which one is closer to being true, nearer in time than farther off? And the way you can always tell that is what price is doing every time. Perfect. I think that's a great answer. As Brian Chan says, only price pays at the end yeah. of the day. So, yep. It is. It is. And, and there's a question from Steve uh, Ferreira about, do you tend to use hard stops or mental stops when you're executing oh, you're your never trades? Never hard stops. Never hard stops. Now, what I am is a very disciplined trader. Hard stops will work for the trader who is not disciplined or the trader who has very accurately defined a chart that says, listen, my thesis is totally broken if it loses this level. You cannot use stops that are, hey, I'm just going to put a 2% stop. The market doesn't care whether you think a 2% stop is good or not, right? You could have an average daily range of 7%. And if you're trading in there with a 2% stop, you're toast. Just go ahead, take your money out, burn it in a pile. It's just gone. So you have to look at that and go, wait, if I'm right, it won't fall through this level. It could test it, but it will recover. And so that's why I always use that stop in that particular space. Now, where I will use a hard stop is if somehow I've run into something that's just blasting off into the moon, I'll, I'll have a stop that's hard that rides up with it. But that's very, very rare. Most of my stops are, okay, the alert comes, you better be paying attention. I have a note written on every single one that says, all right, what am I supposed to look for here? Because I will forget because I look at hundreds of them. And so I look and I'll go, okay, they are supposed to hold this area. So, all right, let's take a look. But usually I am peeling profits off of highs mm -hmm. and looking for those stops to get back in at either higher lows or to restart a new position because it's moving sideways. It's very rare that I'm in a trade that I don't take when, it, when things are moving up to new highs or old highs. I'm always going to peel some gains. And it's, um, if you want to know what I believe my, my challenge is as a trader, where I sit today is putting on bigger size because I have the ability to put on significant size, but I don't because I'm still somewhat timid. And that's, you know, open kimono kind of conversation. It's really something that I, I work through, but again, I have so many of those up, I'm going full and then something will happen and, you know, the wheels come off the bus. And so it's always, uh, I'm always pushing myself. That's the one thing. Always push yourself just a little bit harder, a little bit more so that you can stretch and grow because that's, that's what the business is made to do. Perfect. And there's a question here. I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, but basically the question is, what is the best source source for macro information in your opinion? Wow. Okay. So I would say for macro information that doesn't have a narrative attached to it, you want to go to Fred, F-R-E-D. Um, that is the federal, let me see what Fred actually means. Fred. Yes, it's slipping my mind as well at the moment. Um, it's the Federal Reserve Economic Data uh, site. And so on there, you'll get 
everything. If you have training view, you can look for things like economy, and it'll give you the list of charts. Here's the problem. If you have trouble parsing through data, that might be a little hard, but if you go and listen to somebody, they're going to completely interpret it however it is that builds their narrative. If you've got a bond guy coming out, he's going to say X, Y, Z. If you've got a stock guy coming out, he'll say A, B, C. And so your job is to just look and, you know, it's so, I feel truly my nickname should be Forrest Gump. Because literally, I go, okay, is that moving up or down? If it's moving up, then... Things are supposed to look okay, but if it's moving down, I need to be a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more careful with my capital. And it's just, it's those simple things. We don't have to think deep. We don't. It's actually thinking too much that gets us in trouble very often. Just sort of dovetail it into how does that information actually help me trade better? If you can't figure out an answer, don't even just throw it out in the trash with nothing. Just go, all right, I'm not even thinking about that. If it gives you some insight, then yes, and make some good rules for yourself that you're able to follow. If you can't follow your own rules, then your word as your bond is completely inauthentic. And you know you can't hold yourself to anything. And if your word is inauthentic to yourself, you are going to have a lot of mental conflict, and it is going to show up in your trading. Start holding yourself accountable. And let your word be your bond, of course, to yourself first, and ultimately to everyone else. And it will build consistency and reliability in all facets of your life yeah. and it'll be amazing what you see it'll do in the trading space it'll be phenomenal how do i know i had the same struggles did not hold myself accountable totally inconsistent moving from one system to the next instead of saying what's causing me to make the inappropriate response here when this particular stimulus comes about. Perfect. I think that's well said. And Emery, I also wanted to ask you about obviously having traded for more than a decade, what have been kind of the risk management principles that have allowed you to, you know, preserve your capital and protect it, you know, during market downturns and, and also capitalize on those on those uptrends on those bear bull markets. Yeah. Okay, great. So, always the same. I'll look at the SPX. Oops, not PX. I don't know what that is. SPX. <clears throat> Fat fingers here. All right. So, I'll look at the SPX and I'll say, from a weekly perspective, am I above my five simple moving average or am I below it? And... What is the slope of that line? I started doing this about 12 years ago, and it was the defining space for where I put a lot of money in, in what direction. So the, at the first pass, I had no risk uh, parameters, and I lost millions of dollars. It was very, it was very hard. Those early days were very hard and it was very lonely because they didn't have spaces like this where people could talk and learn from each other. It was a very, um, it was a very secretive space. Very, very interesting. Not like that at all. We, we have a totally different shift in the culture of markets, which I think is fascinating because I love the sharing. So that's the first thing. Once I get under that five, 
weekly moving average, I start watching and saying, hey, I got to trim back. When it gets under the five on the monthly, and we're still underneath there, once those two things coincide, I'm under the five on the month, I'm under the five on the week, I start raising cash. And I keep raising cash until I get above my five on the monthly and my five on the weekly. And then I start putting cash to work. You might go, but Anne-Marie, you missed the bottoms. You know, I'm intraday trading there. I'm doing a lot of short cycle trading, but big money and my major investment events, I start cleaning. I start clearing the decks once I lose that five. And I, it's what's kept me on the right side of upward tracking portfolios for over a decade. And I heartily advise that that is what you look at. Doesn't mean you don't get to participate in great things, but that is your litmus test. That's the one that goes, hmm, I better be a little careful here, right? If interest rates continue to go up and they might, and the market continues to fade and you know starts really compressing, that's why you get CDs. That's why you get, there are all kinds of different vehicles that you can put money to work at. What the problem is a lot of us are undercapitalized and we are trying to go from 1,000 to 100,000 and that takes time, right? If you look at across the landscape of all the people who've been wealthy for a long time, they've got a lot of gray hair and it, you just have to put in the time. But as far as managing the risk, that's exactly my sweet spot. So I'm still waiting to deploy cash. I'm looking at little things and small amounts, but you know, being 70, probably 74% cash at this juncture, it's gonna take quite a bit of market repair for me to get back in. And because I'm gonna be getting back in in a downward sloping formation, I'm still gonna have to be watching it going, wow, I need to take some profit up here. Yeah, just looking at the monthly chart, you can see, you know, at least for that time frame, we haven't really changed the direction. The current monthly candle is just right in that, in the body of the exactly. previous one. Exactly, so, yeah. exactly. And last month we made another lower low. And so, you know, Dow theory tells us, wait a sec, if I keep making lower highs and lower lows, I'm still in negative trend. So yeah, there's a lot that's got to get repaired, a lot. Perfect. And we'll have to see what happens. And uh, Enri, I'd love to hear, uh, I've asked this question a few times today. Uh, what is your favorite um, you know, trading or market related quote that you think is really important for people to learn and, and has a lot of meaning for you personally? Um, it's a quote that everybody gives to Mark Twain, but I don't think he said it, but he gets the, I mean, he gets, he gets credit he gets for everything. everything. <laughs> it's, it's not what you know. No, it's not what you don't know that, that will hurt you. It's what you, what you know that just ain't so. And that is one of the very biggest things for me. First time I heard it, I thought, wow, there's a lot that I thought was so that wasn't. And it made me really make the wrong decisions. And so just remember that price leads, it is the indicator. And the bigger the time frame, the more you understand about it. So that really, I don't know who said that quote, but whoever it was, it truly is. It might, it truly might have been Tom Sawyer or something like that. So yeah, that is it. It's what you think that's, that is that just ain't so. 
Perfect. And uh, my last question for you, Anne-Marie, thank you so much for your time, is what general advice do you have out there for traders just starting out? Maybe this is their first, you know, extensive correction that they've experienced. Uh, what would you kind of say to them to, you know, keep them optimistic, but also encourage them at the same time? Don't beat yourself up. There are plenty enough people in the world to do that for us. That's number one. Step back and really look at the reasons why you're in the market and if it's got to do with ego and driving a big car or living in a fancy house or traveling all over the world those are great but they're not going to help you make the right decisions so separate ego from objective and then learn to enjoy the work if you enjoy the work, you're going to last. Yeah. This is magnificent work, and it, it's it's so exciting. I literally run to my office every day, and it's very, it's a great place to be when you get excited about the work. And so, focus on process. Don't beat yourself up, and trade so that tomorrow you're able to trade again. And what I mean by that is manage that risk. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. And and yeah, of of all the traders who I've interviewed and talked to, you know, passion is like the one thing that they all share. They might have completely different personalities, but they've all got passion for the markets and that's what allows them, you know, to trade for decades. So yeah, I think that's perfect. Emery, thank you so much for your time. Uh, where can My people pleasure. reach out to you um, if they've got questions about your style or just want to learn more about you and, and your book as well? Um, you can find my book on Amazon, and you can find me on StockTwits or Twitter. It's Anne Marie Trades, A N N E M A R I E Trades. And uh, you know what? Reach out, send me a chart, ask questions. I absolutely love talking to traders and helping folks out. And thank you so much, Richard, for always being such a great host. I oh, really appreciate you. it. Yeah, it's a pleasure having you, Anne-Marie. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll be right back with our last presentation of the day, Joseph Fami, uh, talking about four ways to improve your trading. And that'll be at 610 uh, Eastern Time. Hopefully you guys are enjoying this. Um, if you are, please go ahead and leave a like down below and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of the future presentations. And as I mentioned before, uh, we're trying to keep this completely free. But um, in return, if you're enjoying it and find value in it, uh, please go ahead and make a donation to St. Jude's, a really great cause. Uh, we'd really appreciate it. And with that, uh, we'll see you guys back at 610. And uh, yeah, we'll be right back.